we're really happy to be here uh, in Barcelona. Uh, who, who comes for the first time to uh, the family event? Cool, so growing and some retention also. That, that's good. Uh, so the family is uh, an investment firm that was created two and a half years ago in Paris. Uh, our goal is to provide infrastructure to entrepreneurs, uh, which means that we create an ecosystem around us that's uh, composed of the best people. It's startups, it's lawyers, ac accountants, design companies, uh, investors, angels. Uh, and the goal is for startups to be able to grow in an environment that's not toxic. By toxic, we mean that a company that should live doesn't live, and we're here to make every company that should live, live in a long life. Uh, and we're providing basically three things. One thing is education uh, to startups, so that's why we do so much content. Uh, for now, most of it is in French, uh, but we switched to English completely two months ago and when we came here to Barcelona. Uh, the second thing we do is uh, unfair advantages. So we basically negotiated deals with every, everyone you work with. Uh, may it be like Amazon for web services, lawyers, accountants, uh, design companies, every uh, SaaS software you use. Uh, the goal is for you not to spend too much money when you don't have it in the beginning and maybe skip one round of financing that will save you like 10% of your company. Uh, and the third thing we really do is helping our company raise funds. So we help you define how much you need, uh, when you should need it, uh, and then we help you uh, getting the intros to the right people. So we do this on the long term for about 250 companies in Paris. We're starting to do this in Barcelona. Uh, we'll really be doing it uh, in starting in January. And for now, we're really happy to meet all the ecosystem. Uh, we came here in Barcelona because we thought the, the ecosystem was really dynamic. And when we came for the first time, we, that's what we saw. We saw a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs that were ambitious, uh, that faces, faced the same problems that we had seen in Paris a little different, of course, uh, and we're going to need some time to figure out all the problems you guys are f facing. Uh, but we saw ambitious people, we saw a global crowd. Uh, we were really surprised the first time we came, we did uh, an introduction in Spanish, and uh, Usama was like looking at the crowd and he didn't understand why like everyone was like grim. And he asked, we speak Spanish, and it was like a third of the room only. Uh, so global people, so we thought it would be a great first city for us to come, uh, and we we're really excited to be here. So, I am Balthazar, I joined the family as a partner 16 months ago, 17 maybe. Uh, we'll also start up, we count in months, um, not weeks anymore. Uh, and I previously, I worked for Rocket Internet in uh, Southeast Asia, I well helped a couple of companies on their processes and I created HelloFresh with the New York team, uh, which is now a $3 billion company. Um, then I came back to Paris, I started my own startup, I joined the family with the startup. Uh, and when I failed with this company, uh, I joined the family where I basically select all the companies we invest in uh, and then help them on all the issues they face. Um, so today we're going to talk about Airbnb, so a company all of you know uh, that has known tremendous success uh, and we're going to try to see how they made it and which lesson you can apply to your own ventures and which ones you cannot. So everyone thinks that Airbnb had a pretty easy ride. Uh, they, came, they started in 2008, they're now a $20 billion company seemed like pretty easy. But in the beginning, they started like most people, they didn't do the right product. Uh, they had to change and change and they had to fight uh, to find their product market fit. Uh, they almost died before because of lack of money. Uh, and that's one of the very funny uh, stories about Airbnb. Uh, and then they almost died a couple times. First, uh, because of competition uh, led by uh, the company I worked for, Rocket Internet. Uh, and uh, because of regulations. So in every city they go, they face different regulations and it's been pretty tough in their main market in New York. Um, and just as a reminder, that's something we, we're now saying way more because it took us some while to understand. Uh, it's that advices are not generic. 
it's not because we gave this advice to this company that it applies to all companies. Of course, you have stages where different advice applies at different stages, uh, but the mindset is always the same. So we try to give frameworks now for entrepreneurs to take advice and decide whether it applies to their startup or not. So whether you're before or after product market fit is not the same. I'm not going to say to a company before market fit to spend a lot of money on AdWords. I'm going to say it to a company that's after market fit because they know the equation. They spend $10, they're going to earn 20. It works. Uh, before market fit, you don't know this. So every advice is different before and after. It's the same whether you create a market or you conquer a market. So whether you have existing clients or whether you have to evangelize to uh, have new clients. In the case of Airbnb, no one believed someone could sleep at someone else's room, or even less on an airbed. Uh, so they were creating a market, and a lot of things we're going to see apply to companies that are creating a market and not going to apply to uh, a company. Let's say you do a copycat of an American company. Uh, you know that clients exist, and you know the demand is there. Uh, it's not the same kind of strategies you have to you have to put in place. So the Airbnb team uh, starts with an unusual one. Uh, it's two designers uh, that doesn't leave an SF. One tells his friend, come on, we're going to move there. And he said, OK, no, I'm, I'm coming. He didn't know where the startup was. He had no real desire to start a company. He had no tech background, none of them. Uh, and they go there, and they face their first problem. Uh, its first problem is, so the CEO, today's CEO, Brian Chesky, uh, had $1,000 on his bank account, and he comes to, New York, to San Francisco, and the monthly rent is 1.2,000. It's like, okay, I cannot pay my first month, so I have to figure out something. And at the same time, there's this designer conference in San Francisco, uh, where they expected like 40,000 people, and they have no single room left. So they were saying, OK, let's rent one of our rooms. But they had no extra beds, so it doesn't work. They had air beds. They figured out, OK, let's build air bed and breakfast, which is the original name of Airbnb, as you, I guess, all know. Um, and they didn't look like this at the time. It was even less. And they got three people sleeping at their place for a couple of days. It's paid. Uh, it paid the rent. So they, they found their first problem is that people go to conferences and the city is overcrowded. Uh, so they figured out, OK, cool. But then the experience they faced uh, was that they become friends with the people they had in their home. So now he jokes about it, saying that one of the first guy he hosted at an Airbnb uh, invited him as his wedding, and the other one changed careers because of the interactions they had during these three days. And he felt, OK, the, the real benefit of what we do is we actually make friends. So let's build an app that's going to enable people to find the great roommates. And they spent four months on this. Uh, at that time, they brought a third guy, tech guy, to build a product. Uh, so they had a problem, not the right solution, not the right way to analyze it, uh, which is something almost everyone does. And then he faced the problem again. Uh, and the reason he didn't do the first one in the beginning, I think it's that everyone, not a single person, told, told him it was a good idea to host people on the airbeds. It looked really way too bad. And that's something today it has been structured a little bit more. And people are actually looking for IDs that are good IDs, but look like bad IDs, uh, which is always difficult. Because you have good ideas that look like bad ideas, and a lot of bad ideas that are actually bad ideas. Um, so you never really know, but it looked too bad. Uh, but then they encountered the, the problem again, um, and they launched three, three more times. Uh, one at S6SW, which is a big tech conference in uh, Austin, Texas. Um, and they launched the website. They had a couple press, not much. They had two bookings. One of them was the founder, uh, and the other one is a guy they didn't know. So they were pretty disappointed, but so one opportunity is when you launch and no one comes, you can launch again, because no one noticed you the first time. So they actually did this three times, and in the meantime, they kind of built their first MVP, uh, 
and discovered a couple of things. One of them was that the payment was really awkward. Uh, when you came to someone's place, you slept for three days and every day didn't, didn't know if he could ask you uh, for the money on the first day, second day, third day, never know. Then the third day you had no money, you had to go out and the guy didn't trust you, so he came with you. Uh, so he did this a couple of times. And in the end, the MVP will, would integrate payment, which was really not that easy at the time. Uh, 2008, you couldn't just use Stripe. You had PayPal, but it was not super, super easy. So the, the MVP lets you rent a room in three clicks, three clicks only. And this is something he learned uh, from his design background. It's like designing the whole experience to make it as easy as possible. And he also got inspired by Steve Jobs. Uh, when Steve Jobs talked about the iPod, uh, he said every track was less than three clicks away from the home screen. Uh, so whatever trail you go, it's always three clicks. So that you could book a room in three clicks and it included payment, which he had discovered just before. Um, and with this, he got a little more uh, tractions and he got some, the first real clients. By real clients, I mean people that were not at conferences anymore. So one day, he saw a guy book a room in Chicago, and there was no particular even there. He was like, OK, that's, that's something. Uh, and then they had to start a real city-by-city city approach. Uh, and it's not like an Uber-style expansion they can do, because uh, the demand is everywhere in the world, and the supply is only in one city. So they have to do, go city-by-city, city, but they have to acquire clients all, all around. So they did this and they felt, okay, now it's time, we have something, we can go for money. And this is one of the funniest story people tell today, because at the time you could buy 10% of Airbnb for 150K, and everyone said no. So they got eight intro introductions, they figured, we don't need a deck, our product is good, you just show the website, it's gonna work, don't worry. So they got eight intros, full pass, three did, two didn't answer, two took the med meeting, um, and then in the same time, they got this TechCrunch article. Uh, so you all know what TechCrunch does. Uh, peak on your website, then nothing for a long time. Uh, but so they got this peak, and during the, the demo, the website was down because the service was down. Uh, so that's what the beginning of the demo, and a year, uh, an hour later, the website was still down. Uh, and he was like, okay, I learned something. Always have a deck, even if you don't need it, uh, you might need it. Uh, and so they went for funding, and of course, everyone said no. Uh, not of course, uh, they could have been lucky, but it was not the right timing. And that's something you can, uh, you can expect when you're creating a new market. Because when you create a new market, it always takes time to find the first clients, evangelize, and you have different strategies than when you conquer an existing market. Uh, and that's why you need the right team. When I say you need the right team, you need to have a team that's going to be able to make uh, the product better and better without money. Uh, because you don't know when the clients are going to understand what you do, uh, if they ever understand what you do. Uh, so you need a team that has everything. And that's what they had when they had two designers and one developer. Uh, it was just right enough. Uh, and you need to cross the chasm, and the chasm is the time uh, between the first adapters and then when the early adapters uh, really understand what you do. And when I say you're not all like this, is I see too many startups coming and saying, oh, but look, it took two years for Airbnb, it took five years to blah, blah, cow before they, they actually raised money and succeeded. Uh, yes, because they were creating completely new markets. And if you're not creating a market, you should have clients the first day. And the second day, you should have more. And it's not because they had to wait two years that you have to wait two years. Most of you have to wait for a couple of weeks before you can have first clients. So that's typical of creating a new market. So they had to become cockroaches, which is survive, survive, survive. Uh, and I use the word cockroach because it's one of the compliments they say they received when they went to YC. Uh, when Paul Graham told them they were actually cockroaches, they were really proud of it. Uh, it's a new market, it's difficult, you don't know when it's going to ramp up. 
So you just need to survive and to be creative. And that's when they started to sell uh, cereals. Yes, cereals. Uh, not a really scalable business model. You thought it would be really industrial and you have like economies of scale, but they still managed to sell 30K of cereals of Captain McCain's and Obama's uh, just before the elections. And that made them live a couple more weeks, a couple more months uh, before they finally went to YC. And the way they went to YC is because when you have this attitude of surviving and you're able to sell cereals uh, to survive and to build your own product and to prove the world that what you think is true, even if the people don't like your ID, they're, they're going to like you. Of course, you can't fake this. Like You're not going to all sell cereals or, or do something crazy tomorrow. Uh, but still, they said they didn't believe in the ID. They liked the team. They took them. And then they actually proved that the, the ID worked. Um, so a startup is about the people, the people, and the people uh, in the beginning. That's what everyone says. It seems always stupid, but everyone comes back to this in the end. And it's the first time they can also go full time on their company uh, and work from 8 a.m. to midnight every day for four months. Uh, and in YC, they get a couple advices. Uh, the first one is that when you create a market, it didn't, it didn't say it like this, but now, when you create a market, it's really important to have a thousand fans or a hundred fans, not a million users. A million users that like you, it's going to be a nice to have product. You need a must have product for a couple people. And it's really very important, especially more in a marketplace, because the first users are shaping the experience, uh, shaping how the, how the market grows afterwards. Uh, you can really see it in dating apps today. Uh, the first Thousand people really determine the life of the app, uh, so they all focus on this. Going, yeah, you know, you know it is. Um, so that's the first advice they have, and the second advice they have is to go meet every every tenant. So they move to New York, they fly there, and they discover that what works is photos. The photos are a great tool for conversion, and why do people host on Airbnb? Well, it's not actually because. Uh, it's actually their own problem they had in the beginning. It's that they, they need money. Uh, so they take a couple, couple measures on this. Uh, it's that they really try to make people earn money. So they go to banks and tell, the, tell to every, everyone in the bank, tell all the people that have difficulties to pay their mortgages to put their homes on Airbnb. It's going to add them a couple money, a couple hundred bucks, and you're going to get your money back every, every month. It works. And then they promote the best listings. Um, that's when they introduce ratings, and the best goes up. So if you do it very like a pro, you actually get booked a lot, and you win a lot of money. And if you don't do it very well, you just have no one. And it still is like this today, and that's one of the reasons the, Every marketplace tends to get professional today. So actually, most of the listings on Airbnb are not owned by one person, uh, are owned by one person, but this one person has like 10 listings. Uh, it's like 50% of the actual bookings. But of course, on the 1.5 million, there may be a couple thousands that are like this. Um, and the other thing that they do is they start doing things that don't scale, uh, which is an important concept for every startup. And that's why we say that advice is not generic, but that the um, mindset is. The mindset is you should not be afraid to do things that don't scale in the beginning. Of course, you're not going to do only things that don't scale. Otherwise, you're not going to do a startup. Um, so these things that don't scale is the photos. So they realized that nice photos convert very well. So the founder, he went to every, every apartment and he took pictures of the apartments. It's also something that you're not all going to do. I see too many people like saying, oh, this, I'm going to do a real estate platform. I'm going to take pictures of all the apartments. It's going to convert better. Uh, but it's not the same, because it's going to be used once. Once, When it's sold, it's sold. On Airbnb, they count the pictures, and the guy is going to rent it 100,000 times over the lifetime. So 
don't all take pictures and go home by home do things. And they're saying they're building an asset when they do it. And in the beginning, people were really found it really weird to see the founder come. Uh, of course, after time, they scaled it. Uh, and they actually scaled it to a pretty amazing number of photographs. Uh, they have more than 8K today, uh, going all around the world on every new listing, uh, building this asset of perfectly taken uh, photographs. <coughs> uh, other people do it with like customer service. Uh, Drew Houston, who founded Dropbox, he left his phone number on customer service for six months, I think, until he couldn't handle this many phone calls, and he started redirected and then changed his own number. Uh, so they, they went to raise money again on this uh, new advice they got uh, and the new learnings they found when they went to meet everyone. Uh, but it was difficult times. It was 2008, 2009. Uh, the financial crisis was there, and the advice they got was to get ramen profitable, which means they could barely eat uh, with the money they were making. Uh, so that's what they did, and they eventually uh, got 600k from Sequoia, which is one of the best investments of all time now, uh, and Sequoia is one of the best funds of all time for all the investment they do. Uh, so they, they went to, they got this money, and I'm going to show you a couple emails they exchanged uh, between Paul Graham and uh, Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson is the most uh, famous VC on the East Coast uh, from Union Square Ventures. Uh, he invested in Twitter, Insta uh, Instagram, Code Academy, Zynga, uh, all the first round. Uh, so he was really, really, really good at this time. So that's the first one. That's an intro, and I'm going to take a little time on it because you're going to see a bit of fundraising works, you have to tease people. Um, so it's just that talking about uh, they're there just for a couple of weeks, for a couple of days, just meet them, no worries, they're not, looking re not really looking for money. Uh, then it's, they're really good. I, I, would, uh, I would not think about VCs for investing, but you, you're different, so go. So you, you flatter the people and you tell them you're better than the others. Um, and then be sure to ask them about how they funded themselves with breakfast cereal. So this works with YC, but it works with anyone in the world. It still is impressive. And then just say it's going to be amazingly big and the team is great. So th that was the intro. Paul Graham is a guy that you listen to, uh, even in 2008. Uh, so he answered a couple emails and then he got this one uh, from the learnings they had in New York. Uh, saying that they actually needed the product to rent. It was kind of cyclical. People had problems in 2008 paying their rents with the subprimes. It was perfect, okay. Uh, and the third one, uh, when Fred Wilson was like, okay, the, the, he, met the, he met the team, he said, the two young people in the team understand, the three old don't understand at all. Uh, I like the idea, but I think it's not going to be big enough. And that's when he explains, explains the vision they have, which is you go to, you start with be air beds, you go to bed, you go to room, you go to entire home, you go to hotel, small hotel, boutique hotel, and then you get the whole marketplace, which is what we see today. Uh, hotels are not really on Airbnb in Europe, but they are all around the world uh, if you leave uh, Europe and the US. Uh, and most likely it's going to be the same year in a couple months, years, I guess years. Uh, and in the end, he didn't invest. Uh, he didn't invest. Uh, so they get the money and they, and they decide they have to expand to more cities. New York was their biggest market at the time. So they had two things to do. The first was to increase conversion on people that came uh, to have more bookings. So they created this Craigslist hack. So you published your, your, your announce on uh, Airbnb. You had to push on one button. It was also on Craigslist, which has a ton, ton of traffic, and it came back to you. That's what everyone tries to do today. Was what everyone did with Facebook. Um, still do it. Uh, if you're trying to build a community or like a marketplace, many people start with Facebook groups because every, every time you post, you have a notification in Facebook and everyone goes and sees it. 
So you can hack some traffic, they act the craziest traffic. And acquisition, they didn't do uh, AdWords, well, they tried, they didn't work, because it was pre-product market fit at this time. So the main way they grow was PR and word of mouth, which is, again, typical of creating a new market. And one thing that's really important and that we don't see enough at this stage of companies is that people see their startup as something that is something. It's nothing at this point. And actually, the CEO and the company is the people that are behind it. And that's why the CEO goes take the, go take the picture himself, get the feedback himself, uh, tries, to, tries to convince a few clients. That's how you get fans. And from fans, you get a company. Uh, because they delegate the message for you. So at this point, you need to be the guy, guy in Game of Thrones that can change faces uh, and can do anything that the company needs, uh, which is actually what you're going to need to do when you scale, because every six months, basically, your job is a new, new job. You create a product, then you, uh, you raise money, then you move offices, then you hire people, then you have a PR crisis, then you hire more people, then you hire senior people. It's never the same job. Uh, and then you go on TV and it's another job again. Uh, no, it's awesome. So he traveled to every city. Uh, he did onboarding meetups for every host in every city. So he said it was not really surprising in San Francisco in New York because people are used to see uh, founders of companies. But when he went to Oklahoma, or all the other states in the US, they were like super amazed to see the founder of Airbnb come to the city. That's how you spread love. That's how you do it. And he also lived one year in Airbnb. So I guess he pretty much understands what it feels to be a host. Uh, and it's not that he rented a place for one year. Like he switched places all the time and all the time. So, when they did that, they expanded to a couple cities. They raised seven million from another great fund in the Valley. Uh, and they, they started to get the product market fit. At that point, when the product market fit happened, that's when they almost died again. Uh, because Rocket Internet and the Samuel Brothers, so back in Germany, saw it. They just had cloned Groupon, uh, which was the fastest growing internet company of all times. Uh, in Europe, sold it to a Groupon for a billion dollars, uh, and they were ready to do it again. At that, at that time, Airbnb had raised about eight million. Uh, Rocket Internet created Wimdu. Uh, they raised 90 million. They hired 400 people. Uh, Airbnb was 40 people. Uh, but they were pretty famous already in the, in the US, uh, at least in terms of network. So it, they called like the four people they trusted most, which was Mark Zuckerberg, Brad Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, uh, Paul Graham, and, uh, and the founder of Groupon. Uh, we all told them, but Groupon told them they're really aggressive. They're going to do everything they can to kill you. Uh, Zuckerberg said the best product is going to win. And uh, Paul Graham said uh, they're missionaries. Uh, you are, no, they are mercenaries, you are missionaries. Missionaries sometimes win. Uh, and they decided that they were in for 10, for 10 years and that uh, Rocket Internet would only be in for two or three years and would leave it if it doesn't work. So they went, they went and fought. Uh, and actually, it changed the company completely because it changed from peacetime to wartime. And on what time, you have to change the way you manage people. You have to change the way you see your expansion. You have to change everything. Uh, so it was after market fit. It's always future competition when you create a new market. So in the beginning, you can feel that it's pretty convenient. But at one point, someone is going to see it works. And you can always come with a lot of money, other experiences, and try to compete with you. And so they went even faster to Europe. The goal was to have a flag in Europe saying we're here and we're the best. So they went from one country, the US, where they were not even in every state, with one office to 10 offices uh, in Europe in three months. And it dramatically changed the company in one year. And after one year, it was clear that they had won. Uh, they had raised money again. 
Uh, they had the best product, they had liquidity on the marketplace here, uh, here in Europe and in the US. And today, WIM do still exist, but like, it's not even a hundred million dollar company, I think. Something that, I, I'm not, I don't know the figures, but the CEO changed five times um, and, and Airbnb went one. But it really changed the company. It made them a global company in a year. Uh, and the second real threat they had is governments. Uh, so in New York in 2010, uh, they passed a law saying that Airbnb was illegal. So they contacted all the lawyers, which said uh, it was not a problem. Two years later, the New York State was asking for all the data of all the people that ever rented something uh, in New York. Uh, and then they fought. So they said no. Uh, if they had said yes, I think like Airbnb would have died the next day. No one would have trusted them anymore. Uh, every tenant in the world would have said, okay, don't go there. They're going give to give, to tr give it to court. Uh, and they won. It took a, a couple, couple of months, probably a lot of money, uh, but they won. Uh, and it's something you should not prepare for. You should not say like save money because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some trial someday. Uh, if it happens, it happens. But don't, th don't take care of it. They're never gonna bother you when you're too small. Uh, they're gonna bother you la later, and you're gonna need a lot of things to to survive. Uh, and the main thing you're gonna need is the love of your customers because when you have this many customers that are happy, you get pretty a lot of power. Um, even last year, the mayor of New York like, said he was gonna ba ban New York. Uh, his, his rate dropped 12 points uh, in the general opinion, uh, which is not something any company 20 years ago could have done. Uh, he said you ban Coca-Cola, maybe, uh, but like digital companies with the care and the support they have and their service, uh, they are able to, to trigger things and to make low, th low change. But don't prepare for it, it comes after. The only thing you need is like super, super happy customers. Um, and now I want to come back on a couple things that Airbnb does really well. So the first is linked to the background of the two founders who are both designers. Uh, the two initial founders. Uh, it's their attention to details. The first thing they say is the seven star experience. So you say the five star experience is you go, you book online, everything is perfect. You go there, the host is there, he says hello, uh, he gives you the keys, shows you the apartment, you have water, you have everything you need. And when you leave, you just leave the keys somewhere and it's perfect. Uh, the six star is when the guy comes to the airport, picks you up, and brings you home. The seventh star is when he comes with a limousine, uh, picks you up, and he has champagne in the room, etc. And everything they try to do is go to the seventh star. And then he goes up to 10 stars where like, there is a Tesla waiting for you, and the driver is Elon Musk. And he doesn't bring you to the, to the apartment, but he brings you to, like, to a rocket that brings you to, moon, to the moon. Uh, but, like, that's the 10 star. But everything they do is like, trying to reach the seventh star experience. Uh, on the host side, on the client side. Uh, so, for example, they created a super host program to reward uh, hosts that are, have the best ratings. So you need to have like more than five stars uh, 20 times in a row. Uh, and then you need uh, the tons of things. But then they invite you to a super host party in their office where they reproduced uh, all the best apartments they have on Airbnb. And they, they really take care of you. Uh, Uber does also um, last year two years ago at last year. Uh, in Brussels, I was in a, was a Uber prop driver. And he told me like, oh, it was cool. Yeah, this summer I went to uh, the World Cup, was paid by Uber. I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, I had the best rating in Brussels. So they paid me uh, five tickets for me and my family to go to Uber, plus $5,000 for the week, plus the hotel. I was like, okay, they, they know how to reward people. Uh, and he was really, really happy about it. Uh, so that's the kind of thing they do. Uh, they also take care about details in the detail, uh, about design in the de details in the design. The website is always perfect. The mobile app is one of the best we've ever seen. Uh, the founder, he sends an email to all his employees every day. Every night, he sends an email to everyone. 
uh, saying how the day, not how his day went, but what's important for the company motivates everyone. So they take care about the host, they take care about the clients, they take care about the employees, but they do that all the time. And it's something we should all do when you start companies, especially when they're small. And it's very difficult to keep when you go big, uh, because the culture is difficult to keep in the company, but it's something we all should focus on. <clears throat> then another thing they did really well was to stay focused. And it's something I don't see en enough uh, in startups where they like have a product that starts to work and they try to diversify really, really quickly. Uh, Airbnb could have tons of times. Uh, at one point they saw a lot of people putting the cars uh, on the website trying to rent their car for a day, and then they banned it. They could have just put a car, com car thing and a uh, house thing. It would have, it would have probably worked uh, for both, but I guess the overall market would be big, less than what they have today. So they stayed focused, and it's, not gonna be, it's now going to be an issue uh, to sustain growth. They say they are a monoproduct, and there's almost no company in the world this big as a mono product. Uh, so they might think about diversifying um, and they have a couple options. And it's only a question of time or reason. Uh, when you're before pro product market fit, the only thing you need is to survive. So your time or reason is the week and you should never engage in like things that take more than a week. Uh, of course, if you're building your MVP, it can take two weeks. Uh, two months, uh, two weeks is better. Uh, but after everything you do for growth should be within a week because you should measure your growth on a weekly basis. Uh, so you don't plan to do a one, month, a one month's work for your app if you're able to have 10% growth every week. You wait until you're not able to have 10% to say, okay, now it's time to do an app. So after you get a plan, which is product market fit, you go on months, year, but you never go up to 10 years. Uh, and that's why they never add to do two products. Today they're big enough uh, so that the growth can start to slow down and they may, might need to do bigger changes, which is build an enti entirely new product, which is going to take a couple months, at least even for them, uh, just to sustain this growth. Uh, Another thing they did extremely well is to build trust, uh, which is what you guys have to do in every business. Uh, if it's a marketplace, if it's a people marketplace, meaning that uh, you book a service, someone comes at your home, does cleaning and leaves. Uh, it's for a lot of things, it's trust. Uh, if you do a FinTech business, it's also trust. There's a blog post about the design of Mint that's really great if you want to look at it. So what they did is actionable rating. It's rating that you understand. So it's like uh, answers within two hours, uh, five star on this, 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 uh, add this many reviews. It, it works, uh, but they were one of the first to do it. The second is cre created content, and especially on the supply, which they, you never go on an Airbnb listing that looks bad. Uh, it's not just the pictures. It's also the description. It's also uh, accurate. When you go there, there's actually a dryer if they said they were a dryer. So they create all the content and they never let anybody on the supply side post things that were not true. And the last thing, of course, is the best support service, customer support ever. Uh, I don't know if one of you ever like, lost something in Airbnb or got stolen. Uh, you call them, they get, pay you back. Like, they don't ask, they pay you back. Uh, like Uber, you say that the driver didn't take the right route, they just check, but if it's true, uh, they're not going to check if there were like uh, uh, any traffic jams or something, they're just going to pay you back. And when, when you get this, you get clients that come back and say, whoa, that's not what I'm used to, uh, and makes you create trust. Insurance. Insurance, I just mentioned it because uh, a lot of people are like are renting cars today on the internet, are doing a tons of things that need insurance. Uh, insurance is not the first thing you should worry about. You should worry about having a great service. Airbnb, Airbnb had other competitors in the beginning. They had like smaller players in the US that were trying to do the same, that they were providing insurance and like 
differentiating themselves by the insurance saying that was creating trust. Uh, but it was not better than focusing on the experience and focusing on making the product perfect. Uh, and Airbnb had one problem one day uh, when like two people rented a house in San Francisco and like me methodically savaged it. Like they, they, were, they cut the everything like but very methodically. Uh, they broke every glass one by one. They painted the walls with like real, real things. Uh, and it was a PR crisis for them, like tons of articles everywhere. But at this day, they went to insurance company and said, okay, we had one million listings. We had one incident. The premium we're gonna pay is this. And then you have data to say that it's actually worth this. You go the first day, you, they, they impose the, the price they want, you're never gonna be able to do anything. Uh, when you have data to back you up and you say it only happened once, you can then go public, say it happened only once, that you did an $80,000 uh, reparation in the building for free, but not for free, that you offered it and you, you just do everything perfectly and you can communicate on it. You don't need, it's better for communication than having uh, tons of issues with insurance because I'm sure if you have insurance at the beginning people say oh it's insured let's do a party in this apartment uh, when it's at someone's place we all feel a bit like it doesn't apply to everything but like don't say like insurance is the m most important thing you have legal issues are not either uh, and now just about their future uh, I just recently read that 52% of Americans never heard about Airbnb. Uh, I was like, okay, I don't live in the same world than these people. Uh, but it still means that they have a large market that still can come care, and this is in the US. And the second one is that I saw this tweet from Brian Chesky, uh, with the founder, uh, who said that 20% of our business are now stays longer than 30 days which is something that I really found amazing. I'd seen the same program was saying, going to hotels, bigger hotels, bigger hotels, but I'd never seen the going to like long-term renting where they would, you would actually tomorrow rent your flat for three years on Airbnb, which is actually the trend it's taking. Uh, well, there's 12% commission to take is not really much today. Uh, if you see the service and the insurance and the no, there's absolutely no problem when you do it. Um, and when this gets bigger, I figure that they just gonna drop the 12% to a three, 4% and they're gonna just take all the housing market. Uh, well, we'll see. But I, I think they have a bright f future. Maybe this is their second product. We'll see. Thank you very much.